to this roundtable on Oceanic Asia. My name is Tim Bunnell. I'm currently director of the Asia Research Institute, or ARI, that has organized and is hosting this event. So quite a bit has already been done on oceanic spatialities and temporalities at or through ARI at various points, but much, much more remains to be done. And I'm delighted that today's event has brought together such a, an exciting mix of scholars to deliberate, amongst other things, where next to channel these conversations uh, and intellectual currents. And the very final thing I have to say is that I hope at least some of you tuning in from around the world will continue to engage with Ari on oceanic and other key themes during the Institute's next two decades. Thank you again, everyone. And Ian, I, I think it's over to you. Thank you so much, Tim. I'm just delighted to be there. Um, for those of you whom I have not met, my name is Ian Miller. I use the he series of pronouns and I'm lucky enough to teach history at Harvard University where I work on histories of climate, energy and environment as well as oceanic history. I'm delighted to welcome, every, welcome everyone here today for our roundtable, Oceanic Asia, Global History, Japanese Waters, and the Edges of Area Studies. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel and to introduce today's speakers. We're here today uh, to listen to an impressive group of scholars who underline the global nature of the questions we're asking in today's discussion, the impacts of oceanic history, and the diversification of a, a field that not too long ago was not central to what we do, and now is at the center of an ongoing oceanic turn across the humanities, social sciences, and within history, most certainly. We're joined by Professor David Howell, uh, batting for the home team for Harvard University, uh, Dr. Stefan Hubner, who of National University of Singapore, whom has really been the heart and soul of so much of this work and indeed who instigated uh, the broader set of projects uh, that, of which this is a part. Professor Monica Ogawa of Ritsumeikan University in Japan. Professor Sujit Shivasundaram, Shiva excuse me, Sujit, uh, at University of Cambridge, who is in many ways leading this turn more broadly. Associate Professor Takehiro Watanabe at Sofia University and Professor Nadine He of Osaka University. It's a really remarkable group and the work is, is great fun. I also want to note some, you know, the obvious for those of us who are involved in this project, we are none of us here by accident. We may be scattered across the globe, but it is NUS and ARI that's brought us together. And this conference or this uh, panel very much feels like we've come full circle. Our format today is admirably nimble. Each of our authors is going to offer a, about um, five to seven minutes uh, of kind of presentation and thinking, a kind of snapshot intervention drawing out original research and thinking. We're gonna talk about early modern castaways, late modern oil platforms, Hawaiian fishing fleets, and the flavor of rivers, or what David Armitage, uh, who is another leader in this field and others in the field have come to talk about as terraqueous histories, those that blend the land and the sea without losing track of the fecund differences between each and amongst them both. We're also going to talk about uh, the master species of the Japanese uh, table internationally, tuna, and the creatures who consume them. Finally, last but not least, before we begin with David Howell, I want to pause again to thank Professor Bunnell, the director of the Asia Research Institute, to thank the members of the Institute, to thank the remarkable staff who pulls off these complicated events with seeming ease, and we know how difficult this is in the context of COVID. Thank you for making it so easy and productive for all of us. And finally, I'd like to thank our speakers and our audience for being here. Thank you for joining us all. We'll begin with Professor David Howell. Thank you so much, um, Ian, uh, for the introduction, and um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you all uh, today. I've subtitled my presentation, Three Anecdotes on the Way to a New Perspective on Early Modern Japan in the Pacific. So anecdote number one. In 1825, the writer Kyokte Bakin wrote a short account of a mysterious vessel 
an utsurobune or hollow boat that washed up at a village on the Pacific coast of Japan in 1803. The boat carried a single passenger, a young woman. You can see the woman and her boat on the slide. The villagers could not communicate with her, but they decided that she must have been a princess exiled by her father for having an illicit love affair. They speculated that the wooden box she clung to held the severed head of her lover. They did not know where she had come from, but they supposed she was probably from Russia or perhaps Bengal or even America. After a few days, the villagers sent her away and so she disappeared, her fate unknown. Bucking's story is fiction, but at the very least, a similar account was in circulation in 1815. So there is a kernel of folklore or who knows, maybe some kind of actual incident behind it. Nowadays, the story of the flying saucer-like hollow boat is offered as proof of an alien visitation to 19th century Japan. And in a way that is not too far from the purpose it held in 1825. At the time, Japan was mostly closed to formal contact with the world beyond East Asia, and what intercourse there was occurred across the Sea of Japan and the East China, East China Sea, not the Pacific. Indeed, at the time, the Japanese did not even conceive a single vast body of water. Yet the ocean was not quite outer space. By 1825, there had been many sightings of British whaling vessels off the coast where the hollow boat had supposedly landed, and a steady trickle of other ships from Russia, Britain, and the United States had approached the country. The hollow boat story fits into a narrative of something's out there, but we're not quite sure what. Anecdote number two. This anecdote is about a real life Robinson Crusoe named Nomura Chohei. He was shipwrecked in 1785 when his cargo vessel was caught in a storm and carried off on the Kuroshio current or Japan current. Chohei and three companions landed safely on Torishima, a small volcanic island south of modern day Tokyo. Within two years, the others had died, leaving Chohei by himself. For the next three years, he survived alone, living largely on the raw flesh and eggs of albatrosses, until the crew of another shipwreck vessel joined him in 1788. In 1790, yet another crew landed on the Trulis Island as well. After several years of not seeing any sign of passing vessels, the men decided to build their own boat and try their luck at sea. It took them almost five years to construct a seaworthy craft out of wood and scrap metal salvaged from shipwreck vessels and flotsam. Finally, in the summer of 1797, the 14 surviving men set out and after a few days at sea, made their way to Aogashima, a small inhabited island about 225 kilometers to the north. Chohei returned to his home village just in time to crash the memorial service for the 13th anniversary of his presumed death. Nicknamed Mujinto Chohei, Desert Island Chohei, he made a living on the lecture circuit, telling the tale of his long adventure. Anecdote number three, Nakahama Manjiro, also known as John Manjiro or John Mung, returned to Japan in 1851 from a decade spent mostly serving on American whaling vessels. Manjiro and four companions were shipwrecked on Torishima in 1841, four plus decades after Chohei's escape from the same island. They were rescued by an American whaler and taken to Honolulu, where Manjiro's companions remained while the young man continued on to Massachusetts and his future career as a whaler. Manjiro and his companions spent 143 days marooned on Torishima before being rescued. No doubt they were lucky to have been saved at all, but the heavy traffic of Western whaling vessels in the North Pacific facilitated their rescue. Western whalers did not begin to hunt in the waters near Japan until the 1820s, by which time their success in killing so many Southern whales forced them to look to the North, North Pacific for new populations to exploit. That is why Chohei languished on Torishima for years without seeing any ships and Manjiro was rescued after about 20 weeks. A new perspective. A conventional and certainly not unreasonable way to make sense of these anecdotes would be to relegate the first two, the hollow boat and the Japanese Robinson Crusoe to the realm of the prehistory of Japan's engagement with the Pacific and begin the narrative with a charismatic castaway like John Manjiro, who in his career after repatriation contributed importantly to Japan's engagement with the Pacific as a site of economic and geopolitical importance. And sure enough, Manjiro is famous as are a handful of others with similar stories, while my other subjects have been mostly forgotten. From an early modernist perspective, a conventional and certainly not unreasonable approach 
would be to focus entirely on the hollow boat as evidence of just how alien the Pacific was to Japanese people at the time. A surprising thought considering that the country is, after all, an archipelago in the Pacific. But perhaps not so surprising after all, given that the only direction worth looking toward was the West, where the treasures of China, Korea, and Southeast Asia lay. The problem with these conventional and certainly not unreasonable approaches is that they serve to reinforce ingrained ideas about Japan as isolated from or engaged with the outside world. The ocean is a plot device in the narrative of shutting Japan off from those contacts with the West on the one hand, or in getting a few prescient manjidos to North America where they could see firsthand Japan's modern destiny on the other. In any case, there are actually countless stories of mysterious vessels and castaways landing in Japan and Japanese castaways ending up on the Asian mainland, Southeast Asia, and even North America during the early modern period. An oceanic perspective on early modern Japanese history would write these stories into a narrative set on the ocean with the ocean as agent rather than prop, giving equal weight to those stories that eschew teleology as to those that connect somehow to Japan's eventual opening, opening up to trade and diplomacy with the Western world. Thank you. Stefan Hubner will offer our next presentation. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, thank you, Ian. So thanks again to Tim, Ian, the events team, and all of you for being here. So when we think about the Japanese archipelago, we usually imagine islands of various sizes inhabited by humans and other species. However, during the second half of the 20th century, offshore oil and gas drilling platforms contributed to the growth of another artificial archipelago. This platform archipelago, as I will call it here, like other Japanese islands created an amphibious space in which terrestrial and marine habitats interacted with each other. Okay, on its striped parts above the water, it created a new habitat for humans engaged in exploring and exploiting offshore oil and gas fields located below the seabed. Simultaneously, on its submerged parts, the platform archipelago provided a new reef-like underwater habitat full of marine species naturally occurring around the islands and potentially also alien species, even though this is not the kind of alien species that we were talking about in the first presentation. Ships were designed to move at high speed between ports. Platforms, in contrast, usually were towed at low speed and were built to remain stationary for long periods of time. The result was the growth of complex, self-sustaining ecosystems of marine bacteria and fungi, algae, barnacles, sponges, tube worms, moss animals, mussels, corals, oysters, crabs, sea stars, various fish, and other species. In my talk, I want to discuss why and how this platform archipelago enabled technologically advanced adaptation to unstable aquatic spaces and the consequences for humans and marine species. The question of adaptation is important because as of 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other expert groups consider mitigation of climate change and rising sea levels no longer fully possible. Instead, they focus on a combination of mitigation and adaptation. So to begin with the provocative part of my talk and my first point, many of the present critical academic claims of never before seen global scale technological helplessness and imminent disaster because of climate change and rising sea levels Need to, need to be understood in the framework of preceding state-driven terrestrialization processes that were based on land reclamation and a corresponding global mindset in which water represents an element of fear and disaster. In scholarly publications in the humanities, including Asian and Japanese studies, adaptation and an amphibious perspective are regularly either overlooked or at best superficially covered. During the 20th century, the imagery of modernization and development meant that Japanese and other government officials increasingly associated amphibious architecture with pre-modern low-tech solutions. In contrast, technologies of terrestrialization, like large hydroelectric dams, flood walls, dikes, and pumping stations, enabled large-scale land reclamation processes by removing floodplains and preventing perennial river and coastal floods. They promised a terrestrial form of state-led irrigation urbanization and industrialization at home and in colonial empires, including the Japanese empire. After World War II, leading Japanese dam experts continued their careers abroad, 
I therefore argue that the 20th century and its second half in particular marked the moment when large parts of the world, including Japan, had shifted to a normative understanding of human habitats that centered on technologies of terrestrialization. However, the situation changes if this dominant mindset is left and the focus is shifted from technologies of water control and removal to technologies of adaptation and vulnerability reduction, which can also count Japan's waters among its birthplaces. In the late 1950s, oil platform construction turned into a new business model for Japanese companies, similar to Singapore during the late 1960s. So some of the things that I say can also be applied to Singapore. Such platforms constituted amphibious alternatives to technologies of terrestrialization. In the same sense, large scale proposals for the urbanization of Tokyo Bay, such as star architect Tange Kensos from 1961 and US designer R. Buckminster Fuller's from 1966, which are depicted here, can be seen as counter proposals to large hydroelectric dams, since they propose the human habitat elevated above or floating on the bay surface instead of using technologies of terrestrialization for land reclamation process. During the following decades and through much smaller designs, floating and elevated structures proposed or adaptation to unstable aquatic spaces. After all, Japan's coastlines remained prone to a tsunami, which caused the Fukushima nuclear accident in 2011. Architect Kikutaka Kiyonori afterwards stated his opinion that his floating designs would have reduced vulnerability and withstood the disaster, which contributed to a global debate about floating nuclear power plants. This global dimension of the adaptation topic was again discussed in April 2019 at the United Nations Roundtable on Sustainable Floating Cities, so to speak. Moreover, floating high-tech homes and numerous other platforming structures, like floating solar panels and offshore wind turbines, follow the same idea of adaptation to climate change and sea level rise affected, flood-prone and generally unstable aquatic spaces. My second shorter point is that the adaptation process of marine species in certain cases turned too successful. I do not want to turn human adaptation strategies into a complete success story, since they also result in potentially unharmonious multi-species assemblages. After all, many human stakeholders did not appreciate potentially invasive alien marine species moving together with platforms. The platform archipelago, comprising platforms constructed in Japanese waters, platforms being towed to Japan for maintenance purposes, and a few platforms drilling oil and gas in Japanese waters, created a new marine geography that enabled marine species to spread between platforms, ships, and the rapidly expanding number of coastal structures with half surfaces made from steel or concrete. In that sense, what happened here is reminiscent of the so-called shipworm epidemic or bioinvasion in US and other waters between the 1860s and 1940s, which was the result of a rapid expansion of wooden coastal structures like wharfs or oil derrick hosting piers of the early offshore oil industry in combination with increasing ship traffic of wooden ships. One example for transoceanic journey are the bay barnacles, who due to favorable habitat conditions on the steel jacket of platform Maui A, survived the document translation uh, translocation in 1975 from Japan to New Zealand's waters. They did not establish themselves, most likely being removed during an inspection upon the jacket's arrival. But due to shifting perspectives in environmental and bioinvasion management, Bay barnacles eventually played a prominent role in New Zealand's risk analysis in 2011. On the other side of the Tasman Sea, the Australian government in 2016 classi classified the bay barnacles as an invasive alien species of extreme risk. Altogether, the platform archipelago made an inspirational contribution to the construction of floating or elevated high-tech structures, including homes, demonstrating individual and collective human agency in adapting to a transforming world. The related vulner vulnerability reduction for certain marine species who became more able to survive transoceanic journeys nevertheless was actually too successful, I argue, in the view of many human stakeholders from Japan, New Zealand, Australia, and elsewhere. Thank you. We'll be joined next by Professor Manako Ogawa. Welcome, Manako. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you very much for uh, introducing me. I'm Manako, and I'm a scholar of American studies. Today, I will talk about the collaboration and confrontation of uh, among those of the, uh, the Japanese fishing industry, international non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, the territorial government of Hawaii, and White House in Washington, D.C., over the development of the fishing industry in Hawaii during the first half of the 20th century. Okay, uh, when the first Japanese group came to Hawaii in 1885 as government contract laborers at sugarcane plantations, some of them chose fishing as a profession. Within a couple of decades, the Japanese fisher folk um, and Japanese style fishing boat or sampan uh, came to dominate local fishing operations. Uh, by the 1920s, the fishing industry had grown into the third largest sector of Hawaiian economy behind the sugarcane and pineapple industries. With the expansion of the fish eating population, in particular, the Japanese and other Asian immigrants, local politicians moved to protect the Japanese fishing business and increase the food self-sufficiency rate in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii also had another favorable wind to facilitate collaboration with the Japanese. Since the 1910s, Hawaii had a rise of internationalist movements inspired by the establishment of the League of Nations after the devastation of World War I. Alexander Hume Ford in Honolulu established the Pan Pacific Union in 1917. With a strong self-consciousness of Hawaii as a crossroad of the Pacific, the Pan Pacific Union hosted international conferences on a variety of topics attended by many specialists from Asian and Pacific nations, including Japan. By focusing his personal connections with, uh, by using his personal connections with Japanese leaders, Ford urged territorial governor Lawrence Judd to invite Mikimoto Kokichi, a pioneer of the cultural pearl industry in Japan. Because pearl oyster leaves were discovered in Hawaii in the 1920s, Hawaii needed technical assistance from Mikimoto for the purpose of establishing its own cultural power industry. However, Mikimoto turned down the offer to start his business in Hawaii because a new adventure in Hawaii seemed not profitable. But such Hawaii-Japan collaboration shows that local political and economic leaders of Hawaii took a favorable stance toward Japan to stimulate the local fishing industry. Uh, such a positive attitude toward Japan was not widely shared in Washington. In particular, President Franklin Roosevelt and the US military were eager to suppress the Japanese at sea. The US military suggested that Governor Joseph Poindexter of Hawaii prohibit fishing by Japanese aliens because they would conduct espionage for Japan in case of war. Governor Poindexter disagreed. He wrote a letter to President Roosevelt that the exclusion of the Japanese fishermen would jeopardize the territorial, uh, territorial economy. But the Roosevelt administration set up a new regulation requiring that only American citizens could own boat of five gross tons or more and engage in commercial fishing as captains. Complying with this rule, U.S. customs officials seized 19 Japanese tampon board in February 1941. After fierce lobbying by local political and business leaders in Hawaii, all the tampon board were released by October 1945. When Japanese naval airplanes started bombing Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in the early morning of December 7, 1941, some of the Japanese fishermen were operating off the coast of Oahu, and they lost their lives due to attacks from US airplanes. Many other fishermen were sent to internment camps in Hawaiian chain and the mainland US. A few hours after the Pearl Harbor attack, Governor Poindexter placed the entire territory under martial law. The military government prohibited people of Japanese ancestry from conducting fishing activities because their presence at sea was deemed a threat to, ja to 
national security. But the territorial government and local politicians repeatedly demanded normalization of the sea and often confronted the military. The political maneuvering over the liberation of Hawaiian waters ended on June, July 10, 1945, when the US Navy lifted almost all of the restrictions. Japanese fisher folk were finally licensed to go fishing with their ID cards, although they are not permitted to operate as captains until the end of the war. I guess what the conclusion is. Uh, the political and business leaders of Hawaii constantly supported the Japanese fishing operation to feed the local population. In addition, Hawaii Central International Energy Oils stimulated personnel and information exchanges between Hawaii and Japan. As I mean in my brief presentation, the disagreements between Hawaii and Washington strongly reflect the tremendous changes in the political and economic environments of the Pacific during the first half of the 20th century. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll be joined by Professor Sujit Sivasundaram from University of Cambridge. Welcome, Sujit. So what I wish to do today is to consider Japan and oceanic history from the perspective of my earlier work on Sri Lanka and as a Sri Lankanist working on the wider Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, though not directly on Japan. So the first thing to say, of course, is that both Sri Lanka and Japan are islands at the boundaries of Asia. For me, uh, and this is a point that I made in my earlier work, islands are critical to Asian and world history. They have been laboratories for experiments of state making, for reform, for science, uh, for programs of modernity. So Asian studies, of course, can very easily fall into an excessive focus on mainlands. But in the case of Sri Lanka, this has involved uh, this sort of island status and the critical status of it as an island, the participation of multiple invaders who took the island because it was an island and so useful for programs of wider annexation. And also, as I have argued uh, in the British moment, they could make it an island um, and make it an island intellectually, uh, culturally, environmentally and governmentally uh, as well. The position of islands in the ocean in turn has meant that they have served as jumping off points in the case of Sri Lanka for Buddhist monks or Muslim merchants or indeed for plantation systems or for pearl fishers. If so, what does islanding mean for the Japanese case? Indeed, new work shows, and some of it is represented here, that Japan also sought to place itself as an archipelago in the Pacific, and that it too was a string of islands, which stood for empire and nation in turn, as we go into uh, the period covered in some of the talks. In other words, an island-centric method works differently, but can yield useful results at both these ends of Asia. But thinking with Sri Lanka in order to come to Japan is not only about comparison, but there are deep connections between these two islands in the making of the 19th and 20th century. So in growing up in Sri Lanka, one distinct story I recall is the tale of how Japan was exporting human eyes from the island. I've now done some research because I kind of worried that this is the kind of story that a child might, might dwell on too obsessively. But in fact, Japan is one of the largest exporters of human cornea from Sri Lanka extracted from dead bodies for transplants in living people. A former president of Sri Lanka, J.R. Jayawadna's cornea was divided into two and implanted into two Japanese patients. He died in 1996. So there's this Buddhist belief that there's a great deal of merit to be gained by gifting eyes. And this sits within the close Japanese connections with Sri Lanka's eye bank. Giving eyes and keeping them biologically stable over vast distances is a story of science and technology acting over distance. Indeed, in Sri Lanka, Japan has since the 19th century, and this is a sort of prehistory of this, represented a technologically advanced Buddhist state. And it is for this reason that pan-Buddhist sensibilities, as much as science and technology, or indeed ideas of merit, tie these islands together. Some significant aspects of this wider story include the important Sri Lankan Buddhist revivalist Anagarika Dharmapala's engagement with Japan, including an interest in Nichirenism, 
He visited Japan in 1893, 1889, 1902, and 1913. Thinking with oceans, meanwhile, this relationship of these two island societies is also about ships and geopolitics. In September 2020, in the midst of our pandemic, the Japanese warships Kaga in Ikazuchi visited the port of Colombo. One press release noted, as maritime nations with time-honored friendship, Sri Lanka and Japan have been working closely to promote peace, stability, and prosperity for the Indian Ocean in the heart of which Sri Lanka is located. Japan then is committed to a free Indian Ocean, which by the way, is a direct critique of Chinese strategy in investing in ports such as Colombo and Hambantota uh, and in the south of uh, Sri Lanka as well. And this sort of whole debate about China and Japan and port building uh, alongside India's involvement uh, as well carries on and rumbles on um, with a lot of controversy uh, to the present time uh, as Chinese efforts with $15 billion project in Colombo are proceeding apace. Now I'm not a specialist on Japan's relations with Sri Lanka, but the point I make here is that distant islands, in addition to sharing comparative histories in the modern world, need connections with each other to sustain their places in the midst of politics directed from land masses. This is why Pan-Buddhism or Pan-Asianism was significant to the relation between Sri Lanka and Japan, and also why Japan is not forgotten in this new moment of geopolitics with the rise of China in the Indian Ocean. So to conclude, Japan's ocean stretches into the Indian Ocean. It's not just a Pacific story. And I'd love to see work done by Japanese stud study scholars uh, more and more on the Indian Ocean too. And thinking comparatively and connectedly, we might bring into such an account ideas such as Buddhism and Asianism, as much as the techniques and financing of survival in a continuously modernizing and environmentally and politically changing world. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Takehiro Watanabe uh, from Sofia University in Japan. Welcome, Tak. So uh, this talk uh, titled Flavor of Rivers, Salmon, Cows, and Tree Planting and Fishers in Eastern Hokkaido, Japan, um, is, is in the, the book that was mentioned has been mentioned earlier. And the chapter chronicles how salmon fishers tried to stop the government from cutting down an ancient Ainu forest. And, uh, uh, the Ainu are a group of people indigenous to northern Japan, and the, the, the forests were chopped down to create dairy farms because they were worried about, and, and these fishers are very worried about pollution of their coastal fishery ground. And although they felt to stop the, um, the government, they began to plant trees and help establish a government regulation that required the agricultural sector to construct riparian buffers, which are uh, wooded areas along rivers. So uh, let me briefly talk about how I came across this topic and also discuss a few themes along the way. So I heard about fishers planting trees in Hokkaido during my research on the wildlife conservation of black stem fish owls, which are one of the largest owl species in the world. And these owls are threatened with extinction due to the loss of old growth riparian forests. Now, why would the disappearance of ancient forests near rivers affect the survival of this bird species? Well, you can imagine from the name that they eat fish in rivers, so, uh, and including uh, salmonids, so that's one thing. And it also nests in the hollows of trees that are, that are large enough to hold this very big owl. So only old trees, big trees will do, and therefore old growth riparian forests. Now this, uh, I met some farmers and fishers who are members of a community group involved in the protection of these owls. And every year they hold these, uh, these uh, tree planting events at the head of the Nishibets River, which is the river that I write about, in order to restore the forest habitat for these owls. And I soon realized that there are many tree planting events in Hokkaido involving fishing communities and that their origin was very local. In the 1980s, a women's group in the fishing community located at the mouth of the river led the first Hokkaido-wide community trend, uh, tree planting event. And it is these women now in their 70s and 80s whom I uh, had a chance to talk to who use this phrase flavor of rivers to refer to their worry that salmon will no longer return to their local river. And since salmon is an important fish for many North Pacific communities, I decided to look a little bit deeper into this history. 
Now, one of the themes that I, that I wanted to highlight was the way non-scientists like fishers and farmers use science. In Hokkaido since the 1950s, a vast mosaic of forests and wetlands was transformed into farmland, some of it with World Bank money. And what were the ecological consequences of this development? Well, the fishers knew and felt this consequence slowly in their work and their living environment, but it was only with science that their knowledge would be actionable. They had to learn about salmon forest food web ecology, hydrology of forests and farmland, how to monitor pollution of rivers and coastal waters and so on. I was amazed, for example, at how these fishers in the 1970s took their boats down the river documenting the pollution with an eight millimeter camera. Uh, I also argue in my paper that Japan's public discourse on industrial pollution, such as the famous uh, Minamata mercury poisoning case, actually served to hide, obfuscate the hydrological problems that these fishers faced. Um, also practicing science probably required a leap of faith for these fishers and farmers who had reasons to doubt the intentions of state scientists and especially in a region that was treated as a quasi colonial backwater. So I wanted to explore the, the performative and political dimensions of how this fishing community practiced science. Another theme that I wanted to foreground was the way that land governance and ocean governance are linked in a direct physical way by salmon and rivers. Many accounts of the modern era present the well-worn narrative of imperial powers grabbing land and ocean, at the same time extending land-based uh, institutional arrangements to the sea, right? So the movement here is from the land to the sea. But I wanted to suggest a more meandering storyline. A part of my argument is that the fishery industry took look landward due to Japan's acceptance of fishing agreements in the North Pacific. And that was a major factor in the institutionalization of riparian buffers in Hokkaido. Uh, before the 1980s, coastal waters were just parking lots for their long distance fleets. But when they no longer could fish in the high seas, these parking lots became an important fishery ground for the community's economic survival. And the fishers became concerned about their environmental conditions. And because these coastal waters are affected by rivers and the water upstream, the change also had implications for land use governance, rivers, wetlands, forests, mountains, farms, and ultimately cities. So here, uh, salmon and rivers are key because they connect land and ocean. Right? Salmon travel and grow in the ocean and then return to their birth rivers inland to spawn and die. And in this process, the salmon bring ocean nutrients inland and nurture forests. Uh, so the, the term salmon forest, for example, has now become a popular term, especially in the Pacific Northwest. Um, salmon uh, have played a part in shaping territorial claims in the North Pacific. Right? Many historians, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, by the way, but many historians uh, have um, helped me to understand that the role of fishery industry in Japan's military expansion uh, was very important. And agreements and laws concerning salmon fishing in the Pacific have evolved over time and there was general effort to stop Japan, Japanese fishers from catching salmon in the high seas. But in the 1990s, Japan finally complied with the salmon ban. And it is said that Japan now supports this ban in order to protect their own hatchery salmon from foreign fleets. Right? Such protection is given by this UNCLOS um, article um, that says states in whose rivers anadromous stocks originate shall have the primary interest in and responsibility for such stocks. So the phrase flavor of rivers that I use in the title is not only about river pollution. The phrase also echoes the economic and political interests of Japan's fishery industry in the high seas. The fishers are claiming a kind of ownership over the hatchery salmon, the salmon that are going in swimming in the Pacific. And they become a kind of hybrid avatar of Japanese capital, of science, of nature, and state-directed fishery management. Uh, I'll end it here, nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Talk. Our next speaker will be Professor Nadine He uh, from Osaka University. Welcome, Nadine. So um, I did actually choose to um, reflect a bit more broadly on oceanic issues um, to not um, concentrate on my chapter contribution um, to the volume we will be our editing. In the piece of art, you can see here how Hong is playing with common patterns of mapping the world. We usually continents, Territorial territories are the center of attraction. We see oceans. This corresponds to what Elizabeth Mangborghese claimed, I quote, 
the oceans are a great laboratory for the making of a new world order, unquote. She was among those that helped establish the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, which was enacted in 1982. The international resolution established that zones of 200 nautical miles, so-called exclusive economic zones, could be subsumed under national jurisdiction by coastal states with the latter having the sole right to exploit the zone's resources. And we already heard a little bit about this in tax talk. This process has been identified as a change in the historical quality of ocean space. Today, um, I will reflect um, a bit on oceanic space and time based on my work on tuna. Oceans of ink have been spent on how to narrate, label, and periodize so-called modern history. I argue that the territorialization of the ocean was one of the most crucial turning points in the 20th century. In terms of scale, it is the most planetary remapping of the globe in this period in 20th century and maybe even beyond, something we could discuss, including an oceanic view when we think about territory and territorialization helps us deepen the analytical value of it by considering verticality more consequently. The idea of including more and more sea mammals in the, into the territory of states led to a scramble of the oceans and imaginations of what has been made, named by some volumetric sovereignty. Fishing, fish and fishing regimes played a crucial role in this process. Territorializing of the sea was at the same time pushed and undermined by a fisheries regime and a fish regime. What do I mean by that? Fisheries always have been about more than just about fish, part and parcel of attempts to gain monometric sovereignty by territorializing the sea aimed at capitalizing its resources as both the surface and the vertical dimension were linked to geopolitical considerations. The competition for access to fish on one hand led to the creation of new fisheries management systems through technocratic solutions and the law of the sea as a new legal framework. On the other hand, these new regimes were simultaneously undermined and reformed by the fish they hunted and the ecologies they lived in. Territorialization was in that sense both determined and undermined by an ecological regime. So we can define regime both as a form of human being statehood and what has been used for ecological regimes within the natural sciences. Due to its particularly rich fishing grounds regionally, the Indo-Pacific became one of the largest fishing grounds in the world. The race over marine resources in this region increasingly involved resource nationalism among newly emerging Pacific island states who claimed their national right over marine resources in their coastal waters. Both the United States the Soviet, and the Soviet Union competed with Japan for fishing rights and access to the newly emerging nation states EEZ's fishing grounds. What you can see here is that a specifically regional geography was the base of an international scramble for oceanic resources. And I think perhaps along the line or also slightly different than Sujit did put it, that Asian studies as a field can contribute in reconsidering specific regional oceanic geographies. So for me particularly, um, what I would call the Indo-Pacific um, and as well the South Pacific would be very important. But I will come to my next um, thoughts, namely the question, how does this relate to the issue of time? Marine resource enclosure and extraction regimes can be placed within the transformation that has been called the Great Acceleration, and thereby could be seen as an anthropogenic phenomenon. On the one hand, particular human environmental or bodily knowledge was indispensable in this process. On the other, capital-intensive high-tech fishing and cooling methods, as well as transportation, change patterns of labor on the sea when harvesting fish, as well as its commodification. It not only had a profound impact on the life cycles of the fish and oceanic ecologies, but equally impacted human lives. Capitalist social relations deeply transformed oceanic ecologies being coupled with human migration in the 20th century. In this sense, I think it is not productive to see the form of oceanic resource attraction as just another indices of the Anthropocene. Similarly, I shy away from simply depicting the territorialization of the sea and its accompanying oceanic regime as a form of the Capitalocene. 
What Asian studies can offer in this regard is to scale down and show that although capitalist time structured extraction of marine common goods and disease mapping, it was still influenced by oceanic times and temporalities. Certainly, capitalist fisheries work through the sea in particular grounds where fish are present and with its modes of production, it undermines the environmental conditions for its own reproduction. The drive to create profit, profit has undermined both marine species populations as well as various artisanal modes of fisheries. In the meantime, even though fishes are forced to work on capitalist clock time, this regime is undermined by the oceanic creatures and oceanic time. The life cycles and movements of migratory species have their own rhythm connected to the movement of currents, monsoons, and interaction with changing climate. This is reminiscent, of course, of Baudel's conceptualization of various times, the geographic one, for instance. Time defined as time as measured by human clocks is what fishes had to stick to in the capitalist and industrial mode of fisheries on the vessels. Fish fluctuate, and when they approach a vessel, the team has to labor in the most capitalist way. But fishes are at the mercy of the fish in terms of timing. They cannot overcome the unpredictability of oceanic time and, well, and temporalities of the fish and its movements, steered by wind, currents, and much more, undermining the capitalist one. In that process of attraction, Extraction, the time of marine species does not necessarily follow the narrative of progress or acceleration, as it also fluctuates not simply for anthropogenic reasons, but for climate change, winds, currents, changing for reasons unknown to humans and not only in the area that is now named the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you to our presenters and thank you to everyone for joining us here. We look forward to continuing the conversation. We're very grateful to each of you for your interventions, energy, and contributions. Thank you so much, and thank you, Tim. Thank you.